Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this live streamed presentation, Charles Messier and his Catalogue of Celestial Wonders with presenter Didier Salmon. My name is Galen Gisler. I'm with the Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I will be the moderator for, to for tonight's talk, and this talk is being recorded. We are able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors, so we'd like to thank you for your continuing support. Didier Samon discovered amateur astronomy as a teenager and eventually became much later an astrophysicist. He observes every kind of celestial object from the surface of the moon to galaxies a billion light years away. He particularly enjoys visual observations of the deep sky with low tech telescopes and sketching what he sees. With that, I'll turn it over to you, DDA, and I'll turn off my own video. And uh, thank you, Galen, for uh, the introduction. Let's see. I'm having trouble again. Oh, okay. Um, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, last time I gave a, a peak presentation, it was about light pollution, a somewhat grim subject, and uh, tonight I think is going to be a lot more fun, uh, as we'll talk about uh, Charles Messier and his catalog of celestial objects. And uh, most uh, people who are new to astronomy uh, fairly quickly learn that uh, the beyond the planets and the moon, uh, there are these uh, interesting objects to look at called Messi objects. So the talk tonight will be part history of astronomy, part biography. Uh, we'll talk about the catalog, what it contains and some of its unusual objects. And uh, also a little bit at the end as to how to go about observing those Messi objects. So uh, let's start with a timeline of uh, Messier as life to see in what uh, historical context he, uh, he lived and worked. And so uh, we have here, uh, well, he lived in the 18th century from 1730 to 1817. And uh, so the dark line here represents his lifespan. And uh, at the top here in blue, we have several important people or events in history. Uh, uh, that relate to the time of Messier. And uh, so he was a contemporary of uh, Thomas Jefferson. They almost have the same uh, birth and, and uh, uh, death dates. And uh, he also lived at a time of exploration. Uh, for example, the uh, three uh, voyages by James Cook uh, in the Pacific and around the world took place during uh, the middle of Messier's life. And also the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, to the Pacific uh, also towards the end of his life. Uh, he lived through uh, several uh, important wars that the French were involved. Charles Messier was a French astronomer. So the Seven Year War, uh, there's the American Revolutionary War. Uh, he also lived through the French Revolution, which was technically not a war, but uh, was a very difficult time, as well as at the end of his life, the War of 1812. He was also a contemporary of Napoleon. <clears throat> In terms of other scientists who uh, worked around the time of Messier's life, uh, uh, was Newton, who died just before Messier was born, and uh, Edmund Halley, who also uh, died uh, when uh, Messier was young. So uh, Newtonian mechanics uh, and, and uh, was, was well established uh, by the time he was born. William Herschel was a, a, a also a very famous uh, observer who worked from England, was a contemporary of Messier, and actually they corresponded and knew of each other. Uh, the, uh, one of the early chemists, uh, Lavoisier, a French chemist, also lived during Messier's time, and uh, several other people, uh, an explorer like uh, von Humboldt, uh, who discovered the concept or came up with the concept of ecological zones and uh, uh, ecology, and uh, other scientists also, uh, like Ampère and uh, Friedrich Gauss, and so forth. In terms of technology, uh, Macy's time was characterized by a few interesting things. Uh, when he was relatively young, uh, there was the, uh, the time where um, uh, uh, it was, uh, there was a great effort to develop what was called chronometers. And uh, at the time, this referred to a clock uh, 
uh, that uh, a timepiece that could be taken on the ship that was essential to determine the uh, longitude while out at sea. And uh, so the challenge here was to make a, uh, a clock that was keep that would keep time accurately. And uh, despite the fact that it was exposed to uh, great changes in, in conditions and weather and also the motion of the ship. And uh, the steam engine was in, uh, invented around uh, 1760. So that was the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And an interesting fact is that uh, during his entire life, there was no light pollution in Paris uh, or uh, because they started installing the gas lighting uh, a few years after he passed away. So he did his observations in a perfectly dark sky. In terms of astronomy, there were uh, important developments at the time in uh, 1758, uh, the achromatic refractor was invented. So this uh, was done by a Dolan, uh, a British uh, optics uh, uh, telescope maker. And uh, this refers to the fact that uh, a lens has a prismatic effect that creates false color in the image that's being observed and distorts the, uh, the quality of the image. So the acromat invention is that uh, was that by coupling two lenses of, with different index of refraction, you could uh, basically cancel this aberration from the optics and get much, much better images. So this was an important uh, development in uh, telescope technology. The same year, the Halley's Comet was expected to return to prediction by Edmund Halley, uh, who didn't live long enough to see the comet return. But this was the first return predicted and expected return of a comet ever. Uh, so that was an important uh, astronomical event. Messier published the first version of his catalog uh, in uh, 1771. And uh, the final version was in 1783. In the meantime, the planet Ur Uranus was discovered by William Herschel. And uh, in 1801, the first asteroid was discovered, the asteroid series. So let's talk a little bit about Messier's life. Uh, as I said, he was born in 1730 uh, in a wealthy family in a small town uh, called Badonville in the eastern part of France. And uh, that population has not changed much since then, it was about 2,000 people. He showed an uh, early interest in astronomy and uh, he uh, observed, uh, he watched as a teenager the great uh, comet of 1744. Uh, the comet de Chezo, uh, which was, uh, which is known as the six tail comet. And this may sound like a fanciful description uh, for a comet. And uh, here's an engraving that shows a comet uh, below the horizon and its tail is sticking up and it displays six tails. Well, we had a similar phenomenon not too long ago, the comet McNaught in 2007 uh, showed striations in its tail uh, that look remarkably like uh, the sixth-tailed uh, comet de Chezeau. In uh, 1748, uh, Messier also watched a partial eclipse of the sun. Now, he was educated to become a state administrator, and uh, this is because his father was the administrator of a small state uh, where the town of Badonville was located. Uh, it was a principality, that is, it was uh, 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 ruled by a prince, it was a, an independent state as part of France, but, uh, and Messi's father was the administrator for that state. So he was expected to take over uh, that position uh, when he would uh, be old enough. Now at uh, 21, he moves to Paris because he was offered a position as draftsman by Joseph de Lille, who was the director of the Marine Observatory, the, Na the observatory of the Navy, the French Navy. And uh, so he was more interested in doing that. And uh, he had uh, good skills as a draftsman. So at 21, he moves to Paris uh, to take on this job. And his first assignment was to copy a large map of China, large enough that he had to work in the long hallway. But while he was working on this project, he was also trained by De Lille to uh, use astronomical instruments and, uh, uh, and record keeping of astronomical observations. Three years later, he becomes a clerk of the Marine Observatory. And uh, he was also by then responsible for most astronomical observations uh, at that observatory. And uh, in 1758, there's a much anticipated return of Halley's Comet where most European astronomers were searching for the comet. And uh, he would spend uh, months looking for it and would eventually find it. Uh, we'll come back to that a little later. For, and for someone who works for the Navy, 
uh, Messier made only one trip at sea. He was not a seaman. And uh, the purpose for this was to test chronometers. And um, I mentioned earlier, these were time pieces taken on ships. And this is an example of a chronometer at, uh, of that time period made by Pierre Leroy, a French uh, uh, clockmaker. And you can see that the, the, uh, the uh, mechanism at the center is, center is mounted on the frame with a gimbal device so uh, that it uh, can be somewhat insulated from the motion of the ship. I forgot to show you, oops, sorry. This slide here, the observatory of the Navy is located at a, uh, uh, in a building called the Hotel de Cluny in Paris. And uh, so this is a contemporary picture of uh, this, uh, the Hotel de Cluny. And today it is the, the National Museum of the Middle Ages in France. And, uh, but the building, the exterior of the building has barely changed since the time of Messier. And uh, the, this big tower here uh, at the center is where he was doing, making his observations from the top of the tower where there was a structure here to protect his instruments and the observer at the time. The structure is gone. But this is actually close to the Notre Dame de Paris, uh, Paris Cathedral. And uh, you can uh, go, if you go to Paris, you can go see where Messier was making his observations. <clears throat> in 1771, uh, uh, a lot of things happened in Messier's life. He becomes astronomer of the Navy, so he gets the position of his boss, De Lille, uh, who had retired by then. And he moves in at the Hotel de Cluny, where he will live for the rest of his life. He also weds Marie-Françoise de Vaumerchamp, and uh, he publishes the first part of his catalog. Uh, in the same year, he will find two comets, so a very busy year. In the following year, uh, uh, tragedy uh, strikes uh, in uh, Messier's life. Uh, both his wife and his son will die shortly after childbirth. And uh, so Messier for his whole life was married for one year and he would uh, be childless. In uh, 1781, he publishes the final version of the catalog and he suffers a, a severe accident as he fell 25 feet inside an ice house and uh, he broke uh, his hip and uh, several other bones and he would be bedridden for an entire year because of this accident. Uh, in 1789 is the start of the French Revolution which brought, which brought a lot of turmoil in, in French politics and society. And uh, in 93 to 94 was the period of the reign of terror where uh, there were uh, uh, about 16,000 summary trials and uh, public beheadings of uh, a monarchy, nobility, a clergy, and anybody associated with the old regime before the revolution. Messier escapes most of this, uh, I, even though he stays in Paris. Uh, however, he will lose his pay as astronomer of the Navy. He loses his pension as from the Académie des Sciences. Uh, uh, and also he, he loses his state paid rent uh, at the Hotel de Cluny where he lives and works. Still, he manages to keep working through this time and he, recover, he discovers a comet in 1793. In 95, uh, the, the situation has stabilized in, in France and the uh, Académie des Sciences, uh, the, which Messier was a member, uh, has been replaced by the National Institute of the Science and Arts and he becomes a member of that. And also they create the Bureau des Longitudes, which was responsible for timekeeping which was a major uh, responsibility of uh, astronomers and observatories at the time. And here on right, we see a picture of Messier at age, a uh, portrait, sorry, of Messier at age 40. And uh, he looks much younger than a 40 year old man here. And uh, Messier himself uh, uh, commented on that fact at the time. Uh, in uh, 1802, William Herschel will visit Messi in Paris and finds that he's still working at 70 years, 72 years of age. Uh, but uh, in the following years, he has a declining eyesight and his uh, level of activity also declines. In uh, 1815, uh, he has a stroke that leaves him partially paralyzed and he will die two years later. And if you go to Paris, you can see Messi's grave at the cemetery of uh, Père Lachaise. Uh, which is a, a, a famous cemetery in Paris where lots of famous French people are uh, buried. And uh, it's a, a major tourist attraction uh, actually because of that. So uh, you can stop by and see Messier's grave there. 
During his life, he received many honors. He was recognized as a leading French astronomer in his lifetime. And uh, even King Louis XV paid attention and nicknamed him, nicknamed him the ferret of comets because he was so successful in his searches for comets. He was a member of many scientific societies in Europe uh, uh, as recognition of his work as an astronomer, especially the famous, famous Royal Society of London and Academies of Berlin, St. Petersburg, uh, Harlem in the Netherlands and in several other countries. In France, as I mentioned, he was a member of the Académie des Sciences uh, in 1770 and then later uh, in the new uh, uh, incarnation after the revolution at the Institut National des Sciences et des Arts. He received uh, from Napoleon himself the cross of the Légion d'honneur, uh, an award that was created by Napoleon. And uh, this picture here on the right, and this is the equivalent of the Presidential Medal of Honor here in the United States. So uh, it is a, a very uh, high uh, honor in France. Macy also has a lunar crater named after him. Actually, it's a double crater it's shown here. Uh, there's Messier, the crater Messier, and the crater Messier A. Uh, the, these are small craters, but uh, they are a pair of craters formed at the same time, and they were carefully chosen for to uh, assign uh, Messier's name to them because, as you can see on the left here, there are two white streaks. And uh, these rays are common around fresh craters on the moon. You can see some rays around other craters uh, on this picture. Uh, however, this crater is unique in having these uh, a pair of rays that is uh, directed in one direction only. And that's because the impactor uh, that created the crater, these two craters came in at a very low angle here from the right and projected ejecta in this direction. That makes the crater Messier A looks a bit like a comet. Macy was also honored by having a constellation named after him that was created by another astronomer, Lalande, in 1775. And uh, it was called Custos Messium, uh, means Watchman Messier. And here's an a, a, a illustration of Messier's constellation uh, in the uh, influential atlas at the time, the Uranographia of Bode from 1801. Now, uh, like several other constellations, it has not, uh, been retained in uh, more modern times, and the constellation was abandoned in the mid 19th century. This constellation is located in this part of the sky. So here's the constellation Cassiopeia, shaped like a W. And here's the, uh, the pole star, Polaris. And these are the Messier constellation was located in this part of the sky between those two. So let's talk a bit about his work as an astronomer. Uh, he, uh, his first documented observation is that of a transit of Mercury in 1753. Uh, so that's when, as seen from Earth, Mercury will cross in front of the disk of the sun. He observed a second transit uh, much later in 1782. And in the meantime, he also watched the transit of Venus of 1761. And here's an image of such an event. Here's the, the little black dot here is the disk of Venus uh, uh, projected against the, uh, the disk of the sun. And uh, so that's the transit of Venus. And um, uh, a thing I, uh, I thought was rather curious that I learned while putting this talk together is that Messier almost discovered the first asteroid, asteroid Pallas, uh, while he was observing the comet of 1779, uh, he came across uh, the asteroid Pallas, uh, but didn't recognize it as such. So here's the uh, star chart that he drew uh, for uh, this comet. And here's the path of the comet of 1779 that he observed. So every day he watched it, he plotted his, its position uh, over a period of several months. And uh, as he did so, he would add the stars that he would see near the comet to his star chart. So here's the Virgo, the Virgin, and here's uh, the uh, Coma Berenices, which is the hair of Berenice. Uh, so there's a wig uh, up there in the sky. And the comet went between those two constellations. So this star here that he plotted, added to his chart, uh, turns out to actually be the asteroid Pallas uh, that would be uh, discovered and recognized in an asteroid 23 years later. He uh, observed uh, occultations when the moon goes in front of a star, eclipses. Uh, he took records of sunspots of weather and also observed uh, Uranus and the first two asteroids, Ceres 
Ceres and Pallas uh, once they were uh, officially discovered. But uh, most of his career focused on the search and the observations of comets. It was a hot uh, topic in astronomy at the time. Uh, remember that this was uh, uh, after the triumph of Newton's uh, theory of gravity that explained the motion of planets and of their moons. And uh, comets were unusual because they have orbits that are uh, rather different from those of planets. Planet, planet orbits are fairly circular around the sun, but uh, comets have very elongated orbits, which is why we see them only for a short period of time while they come near, near the sun before they pull away into the distant uh, solar system. So uh, these were interesting to observe and to test uh, uh, Newton's theory. And they were also unpredictable because, um, except for Halley's Comet, that is. But, um, and uh, so one had to search for them and be lucky enough to find them. <clears throat> so this brings us to the return of Halley's Comet in 1758. So Halley, after looking at historical records and studying Newton's theory of gravity, it figured that several apparitions of a bright comet uh, actually seem to be uh, periodic. And he predicted that it would come back in 1758. And um, so, but they, uh, they could calculate a rough orbit from it from historical records, but they didn't know at what time, how long the, the period wasn't known well enough that they wouldn't know what time of the year it would reappear. So Messier uh, used, made star charts based on calculations by his, his boss, uh, Joseph de Lille, uh, who had calculated the position of the comets and he plotted his charts and he spent months looking for it. And uh, what happened is that uh, Messier finally realized that there must be a mistake in the Lille, Lille calculation and started widening his church his church, <laughs> his search for the comet. And um, and he would eventually find it, but a month after a uh, German amateur astronomer had found the comet. So uh, the, at the time, communication was slow. So it was an independent discovery, but uh, he's not credited for it uh, because he was uh, a little bit late. But in the process, he uh, independently discovered another comet, the comet Dodanux in uh, 1758. And uh, that comet actually went by an object that we now know as Messier 1. And so he, uh, he, what, it was an uh, independent discovery of Messier 1, which had been discovered actually uh, more than 20 years earlier by someone else. His first uh, comet discovery was in 1763, and he would go on to uh, independently discover 20 comets, 13 of which were his, uh, his first discoveries. That is, they, he has 13 comets that bear his name today uh, by their rule uh, for comet naming. So uh, he observed about 50 comets during his life. He's, of course, today known mostly for his catalog of 103 clusters and nebula, and we'll come to that uh, uh, in, in a few slides. So one thing that's interesting is, is what kind of telescopes do they use? Uh, and uh, there's actually a list of uh, more than a dozen telescopes that he used over time. And uh, however, there, as far as I know, none of them survive. I couldn't find any pictures of them, but I gathered images of telescopes at the same time, period, and uh, that show uh, the kind of uh, telescopes he'd be using. So he used several ordinary refractors. These were not acromats. These were single lens refractors. They had this color aberration problem. And uh, if you look at the description, then most of them are like 20 to 30 feet long and magnify about 100 times. And a uh, 30 feet foot long telescope seems pretty outrageous. And here's an a, a engraving of uh, the Royal Observatory. This is in London. This is not Macy's Observatory. But you can see such a telescope here on the right that's speaking through a window. And it's uh, uh, one uh, end of it, or the middle of it, is held by a ladder. And there's an easel here that uh, holds the eyepiece end. And uh, you can see that observing with something like this is, is rather uh, difficult. And you're also quite limited in the uh, part of the sky that you can view. He, one of his favorite uh, telescope, act, uh, however, was a, a, a three and a half foot long, and I forgot to mention that, but they, uh, the telescopes are described with their focal length, the length of the telescope, basically, not by their aperture like we do today. So that's a bit frustrating, uh, but we know that this 
one had about a three inch aperture and magnify 120 times. So this was an acromat. So this represented the best technology at the time. And it was made by the man who uh, uh, invented the acromat. And here's one of his telescopes. Uh, this is a 1.4 inch telescope and a beautiful uh, workmanship here. <clears throat> he also used a few reflectors at the time. Uh, he had a favorite uh, Gregorian reflector uh, that was uh, 32 inches long, 28 foot focal, last seven and a half inches aperture. And here's a uh, similar telescope from the time. This is a six inch. And a Gregorian reflector is similar to a Cassegrain, a slightly different optical design, but qualitatively they're quite similar. He also used a Newtonian reflector uh, that was four and a half foot long. We don't know the diameter. And here's an example of a telescope. This one was built by Herschel. Uh, this is a seven foot long, six inch telescope. Um, so, we, so these are the kinds of instruments that he was working with. But since he was looking for comets, he preferred to use this achromatic uh, refractor that provided a wider field of view. <clears throat> The other thing to uh, remember or to keep in mind is that uh, uh, the telescopes, the reflecting telescopes at the time were made with a solid metal mirror and uh, made of a, an, a reflective alloy called speculum metal. And uh, however, this was not as reflective as the coatings we have today on our telescopes and it was also oxidized. So it needed to be repolished regularly. And therefore those telescopes uh, were not nearly as uh, performant as the equivalent telescope today. So let's get to the catalog. So here's a, a, a copy of two facing pages in the catalog. So uh, this is what it looks like. The, uh, that's, and that's the final version that was published. So uh, for every object, there's an entry here with the date when he made the observation. And uh, there's the uh, catalog number. Here's Missy 52 that I highlighted. And here are the coordinates. Uh, a right ascension and declination, which are analogous to longitude and latitude on Earth. So he gives the coordinates that he measured himself in every instance. And that's what the date refers to here. And then he, on the facing page, he provides a description of the object. And uh, here's a, a, I'll read a translation here for Macy 52. Uh, so this is a cluster of very faint stars mingled with nebulosity, which may be seen only with an achromatic refractor. He refers here, I think, to the nebulosity. Uh, it was while observing the comet that appeared in that year that Mr. Messier saw this cluster, which was close to the comet on September 7th, 1774. It is below the star D in Cassiopeia. It now has a new, a different name. But, uh, and the star D was used to determine the positions of the star cluster and the comet. And here's a picture of Messier 52. So the cluster is here. So it's a beautiful, rich cluster of stars. And um, the nebulosity he refers to is not what we see here on the right, which is far too faint for him to have seen. And actually, this is the so-called bubble nebula. There's a little soap bubble of gas here. So what he was referring to is that uh, in his small telescope, uh, even the best that was available at the time, the chromatic refractor, the faintest stars in uh, uh, the uh, cluster here appeared as some kind of nebulous glow behind the brighter stars. <clears throat> but there is no nebulosity in this cluster. So uh, let's talk a bit about how he this the catalog was built. So uh, it is called, and that's a translation, the catalog of nebulae and star cluster that can be found amongst the fixed stars from Paris. So it was published in three parts, really. And uh, so the, here's the history of part one. He found Messier 1, as I mentioned before, while observing Comet de la Nuix in 1758, but this had been discovered before in 1731. He also found Messier 2 uh, as he plotted it on his chart of Halley's Comet, uh, but also had been discovered uh, several years before. So his first discovery is really Messier 3, which is a globular cluster in Canis Venetici, uh, the hunting dogs. And he really got going in 1764, and uh, where he uh, added 38 entries in a period of just seven months. So his goal really was like, uh, you know, the, the usual uh, story about Messier is uh, that one is accurate. He was looking, uh, he was cataloging comet looking objects uh, through his comet hunting telescope. 
And uh, the purpose of this was when you would come across something that looked like a comet, you have to determine, well, is it a comet or not? And the, the, the giveaway here is that a comet moves against the background of stars. So you have to wait a half hour or an hour for the comet to have moved a little bit. And then you know that it is a comet, a body in the solar system and not a body that belongs to the very uh, distant, more, much more distant universe beyond the solar system. So uh, to be more efficient, then he cataloged the objects that he would run across that way. And uh, you may wonder how one could confuse a star cluster with a comet. And um, first, the telescopes were small. But also, and, and you, as you, we saw, he reported nebulosity, uh, something that looked like nebulosity that really wasn't at the time. And um, the, uh, the fact is that comet hunters uh, usually look for comets in, in the proximity of the sun. So they search for comets during twilight, after sunset and before sunrise. So they often look in the sky that is not all that dark. And uh, as a consequence, a, a, a faint, a faint stars in a cluster on a brighter background uh, during twilight may actually appear nebulous rather than a group of distinct stars. He also was aware and used a list of uh, existing list of objects by Halley, Hevelius, and other astronomers. And he looked for these objects and, and added them to his catalog as he found them. But he also made a list of those he could not find. He, uh, so uh, the catalog uh, was, uh, as we saw, he recorded himself his own positions for those and uh, you know, his own descriptions and also dutifully credited the original discoverers. But there was no systematic search. Uh, and in uh, 1765, by then he had 41 objects and he uh, decided to round it up to 45 and by adding well-known objects. And uh, so that explains some of the questions you may have if you're an amateur astronomer and you look at catalogs of why would you think that the Pleiades belong as an object that you can confuse with comets? Well, this one is a quirk of the catalog. So he added the Orion Nebula, which is really two pieces of nebulosity that have two different catalog numbers, M42 and 43. The Beehive Cluster, Messier 44, and the Pleiades Messier 45. 45, all of which have been known since, well, except for Messier 43, but uh, have been known since antiquity. And, uh, but he added them for uh, just before publishing them. So the first publication was in 1771, 45 objects, 18 of which he had discovered himself. In uh, a few years later, he published a supplement to part one and uh, in 1780 that added 23 new objects. <clears throat> And uh, so the last observation that he made for the catalog is dated in April 1781. Uh, by then he had a list of 100 objects, uh, 24 of which were discovered by uh, his colleague, uh, Pierre Méchain, who uh, worked also at the Navy, but a different office and was an astronomer. He was also looking for comets. And so they worked together on this and Méchain would discover an object, pass it on to Messier who would go on and measure the coordinates and write his own description and credit Méchain for the discovery. Um, so uh, in the end, uh, there was uh, the final version as 103 objects. And uh, there have been several uh, developments since then uh, because uh, two years after uh, the publication, in, uh, that was published in 1781. Two years later, Méchain sends a letter to an astronomer at the Berlin Academy, Bernoulli, and uh, where he mentioned that he has discovered several objects uh, that would uh, become Messier 104 to Messier 109. Uh, also, Messier had, in his own copy, he had made annotations uh, in his catalog that uh, indicate that he knew of, of course, Méchain's discovery and he intended a revision uh, including these additional objects. So in the 20th century, the first half of the century, basically several astronomers went through this and the historical records uh, uh, and the observations of Méchain and uh, Messier and his co their correspondence. And the catalog has been extended to 110 objects that they knew of. And uh, so as it stands today, and I guess that's, uh, it, the catalog includes 110 objects and uh, will, uh, is unlikely to grow further than that. So there are 110 Messier objects. So as I said earlier, the catalog is incomplete and is somewhat 
haphazard compilations. So many of bright objects that uh, would stand very well and uh, he could have seen this candle in his telescopes are missing from, from this catalog. Things changed quite a bit uh, uh, later uh, after that publication when William and his sister Carolyn Herschel conducted the first systematic survey of the sky. They were inspired by Macy's work and Herschel was also a telescope maker. He would make uh, some of the more power, most powerful telescopes at the time. So here's his uh, favorite, favorite telescope, this 20 foot long telescope with a, a 19 inch mirror at the bottom. It's, it's a gigantic contraption. But uh, with this telescope, he made a survey, systematic survey of the sky of pretty much everything he could see uh, as terms of clusters and nebula. And he discovered uh, with his sister Carolyn, 2,500 clusters and nebula in a period of 20 years. So uh, there was a very uh, a major shift here in perspective and scientific motivation. Herschel really wanted to know what was out there in the universe while Messier was much more focused on the solar system itself. So the catalog, <clears throat> uh, contains different classes of objects. So uh, there are seven diffuse nebula, uh, four planetary nebula. There's one supernova nova remnant, that's Macy 1. <clears throat> there are uh, 27 open clusters, uh, 29 globular clusters, and the most uh, numerous objects are galaxies. There are 40 galaxies in this catalog. And there are a couple of interesting quirks, a double star, Macy 40, and a small asterism, which is a, a grouping of stars with some pattern that he called the cluster, but uh, it only has four stars. And we now know today that uh, these stars are unrelated. They're not uh, associated like uh, stars in open clusters like this. <clears throat> so I'd like to talk about a few of the uh, Macy objects in some depth as to what uh, they are and uh, what you can hope to see in the telescope. So the first is uh, a diffuse nebula. This is Messier 8, known as the Lagoon Nebula. It's uh, uh, in Sagittarius. Uh, it's visible in the summer uh, sky. And it's 5,200 light years away. And uh, so this is an object where uh, we see a glowing cloud of gas here. The space between the stars is not empty. It contains gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, and uh, also uh, grains of the clouds of dust. And uh, the dust actually shapes a lot of the darker features that we see here in the nebula. So the dust is in the foreground and you can see little clumps here that are very dark. It also has a cluster of stars associated with it. So what this, whole object represent is a stellar nursery. Stars are being born today in out of the gas that we see here, especially in those little dark blobs here that we see, they're called Bach globules after a, a Dutch astronomer, Bart Bach. And the cluster here is actually was born two million years ago out of another part of this cloud and it's in the foreground. <clears throat> and uh, this nebula is called a lagoon because of this dark feature here that cuts across it and actually kind of separates the two brightest part in, uh, in two distinct regions. And another interesting feature here is near the center here is known as the hourglass nebula. <clears throat> so the, the gas here is illuminated by this star here, which is a very massive star, 40 times the mass of the sun. So these stars are quite rare in the universe. It's a very young star. It will live less than 10 million years. And it's a half a million times more luminous than the sun and its radiation uh, is what makes the surrounding gas glow. So the cloud of gas is actually much bigger than what we see here, but only this part is illuminated and we can see with our eyes. So the nebula is fairly big, about 60 light years across. And here the Hubble Space Telescope took a picture of the hourglass nebula. So this blow up of this region and you can see here the hourglass at the center and uh, it's illuminated by this star here. And you can see the incredibly complex turbulent behavior of the gas here that is disturbed by the uh, radiation from uh, the surrounding stars. And it has a three dimensional feel to this in this picture. So this is quite remarkable. Now, if you look at this with a telescope, 
uh, this is what you'll see. First, uh, with the naked eye, you can see Messier 8. It's a bright, small, small, small patch of, of light in the Milky Way. It's a very nice binocular object. You'll see the nebulosity. You'll see the two pieces of it split by the lagoon and the cluster. In a 10-inch telescope, this is what you'll see. Uh, you can see quite a bit of feature. The lagoon, of course, stands out quite a bit. The hourglass nebula is visible as well as the cluster. And you can see some of the interplay of light and dark that is visible in the pictures, including embayments of dark features near the edges. So this is a very interesting object to look at. Next is the uh, uh, Messier 1, known as the Crab Nebula. And this is the remnant of a supernova explosion. This object is in Taurus, so it's visible in the fall and the winter, and it's 6,500 light years away, so uh, much further than M8, and actually kind of in the opposite part of the sky. It's one of the most uh, uh, amazing MAC objects. Uh, we now know that it is uh, uh, the result of the explosion of a supernova in 1054 that was chronicled by Chinese astrologers who reported that the, 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 there was this new star appeared in the sky and it became so bright uh, within a matter of days that uh, it was visible during daytime for 23 days. And it was visible at nighttime for two years before it faded out of sight. Now, the nebula that we see is the uh, expanding gas from this explosion. And at the center, is a pulsar, and it, it, which is also a neutron star. So there's a pair of stars here in the middle of the nebula, and the one on the right is a neutron star. What is a neutron star? Well, during the explosion of a supernova, this, the core of the star is compressed to conditions that are so extreme that uh, a nuclear reaction occurs between the electrons and the protons uh, that uh, form the star matter, basically. And then uh, this reaction drives the neutrons to, uh, the, sorry, the electrons to react with the protons to make neutrons. So after the fact, after the outer parts of the star have exploded and are expanding, the core of the star stays behind as a big ball of neutrons. Now this neutron star is, is a mind boggling object. It is like the nucleus of an atom, except it's made all of neutrons. It's as dense as that but it has about twice the mass of the sun and its size is about 10 miles in diameter. So that's the distance between downtown White Rock and downtown Los Alamos. So you can visually picture out there how big a neutron star is and imagine that this actually weighs two times the mass of the sun. And it gets even more extreme. The neutron star is rotating. It's rotating at 30 revolutions per second. So imagine that. And uh, so as it rotates, uh, it sweeps beams of uh, radio emission towards the Earth. And so we see pulses at radio waves and also in the optical and x-rays. But we see pulses, 30 pulses per second from this pulsar. So it's actually uh, like a, a lighthouse in the sky. And this was the first pulsar that was discovered in 1967, I believe. So the nebula is expanding at 1,000 kilometers per second. And uh, here's a, uh, a two-frame movie that shows nebula photographed 30 years apart. And you can see here, clearly see the expansion of the nebula if you look at the brightest filaments, for example. Here's an image of the Crab Nebula taken with the Hubble Space Telescope that shows an incredible amount of detail of these filaments that are kind of the outer front of the nebula. This is three-dimensional that is expanding outward. <clears throat> and the nebula inside is filled with this milky purple glow here of uh, mostly uh, radiation from electrons and, and all of this is powered, well, the, the central glow here is powered by the neutron star itself. Now the Crab Nebula is visible in binoculars. It's actually reasonably bright and large. And uh, in a, a large telescope, you can see like a uh, 16 inch or so, you can see the bright filaments like these here. And uh, I've actually seen this in a 30 inch telescope and the edges here are just amazing at how much filaments you can see in a telescope of that size. Uh, the pulsar is actually very difficult to see, and I could barely see it in that 30-inch telescope, that one chance I had to 
look at this. Uh, but um, I haven't given up with searching for it with my 18 inch. Now, if a star doesn't die as a supernova, uh, uh, it will end up turning into a white dwarf, which is the fate of most stars, including the sun. So our next object is called uh, a planetary nebula. It's Messier 27, is known as a dumbbell nebula. It's in the constellation Vulpecula, the sun, uh, sorry, the fox, and it's visible in the Milky Way in the summer. So this one is 1200 light years away, and it's basically the last stage of the life of a star becomes it, before it becomes a dead star uh, uh, known as a white dwarf. So Messier 27 is a bright and large planetary nebula. It's about three light years across. And uh, this phase uh, at the end of the life of the star, uh, it, after it has become a red giant, it, the star basically gently blows its outer layers until it, it reveals its central core. So this is not an explosion, it's called a stellar wind. And this is, uh, expands at about 20 kilometers per second, much, much slower than Messier 1. And at the center here is the dying star. That's the core of the red giant that was there before, and it will become a white dwarf. The nebula here has been expanding for about 50,000 years. In 100,000 years or so, we'll have expanded so much that it will become invisible. Uh, it'll be too thin to see. And uh, the dying star will be a white dwarf and will be just an anonymous lonely star like the ones we see here in the background. The Hubble Space Telescope looked at this part of the nebula, and you can see here how beautifully complex it is. Uh, we can see lots of stars through the nebula, but you see is these billowing, billowing clouds of gas and also uh, small dark blobs of dust that are being uh, stretched out by the radiation and the wind from the central star as everything here is pointing back towards the central star itself. Um, Here's what you'll see in a telescope. The uh, Messier 27 is easy to see in binoculars. This is a drawing I made with a six inch telescope and you can see now what it's called a dumbbell nebula. It has uh, two bright spots, uh, the upper and lower part of the nebula. And uh, it looks greenish in a 10 inch telescope that betrays the presence of oxygen in the gas. And um, the central star is not easy to see because of the background of the nebula but uh, it's visible in a 10 inch telescope. The next object <clears throat> is a globular cluster, Messier 13, the great Hercules cluster. So that is in the constellation Hercules and it's uh, a spring and summer object. And this one's very far away, 24,000 light years. And um, it looks like a ball of stars and uh, it is a ball of stars. And all these stars here are in orbit around the center. So all of this is in motion, uh, and uh, which is why it doesn't collapse on itself. And globular clusters are a different kind of objects. At least they're distributed differently in, in, the, in the galaxy. So here's a diagram of our Milky Way seen from above. Here's the center and we see spiral arms and the sun is about halfway out uh, from the middle to the edge. Now, if you look at this sideways, this is what you'll see. You have a flat disk of stars here with a bulge near the center and the globular clusters are scattered around the center like this and sometimes up to great distance in the halo of the galaxy. And the clusters are in orbit around the center, each of them in its own uh, highly inclined orbit. So that's why they are far away because they're far from the plane of the Milky Way and far from the sun. <clears throat> Now, what's fascinating about these is that they contain hundreds of thousands of stars. Messier 13 is about half a million stars. Uh, a 10 inch telescope will reveal a, a hundred easily. And these are the oldest stars that uh, are still around in the universe. The Messier 13 is 13 and a half billion years old and the universe itself is 13.8. So only a few hundred million years elapsed between the uh, birth of the universe and the formation of, this glob of these globular clusters. So these are the oldest things you will ever lay your eyes on if you look at a globular cluster. Now, as you can imagine, the density of stars is very high at the center and uh, the Hubble Space Telescope reveals how dramatic this is. <clears throat> 
so this is the central part of the cluster and you can see uh, the vast, vast number of stars that are really closely packed together here. If you were to travel to the center of the cluster, the sky there would be totally different from what we see here from Earth. You, uh, uh, there'd be about a dozen stars uh, as bright as Venus <clears throat> in the sky, and there'd be a thousand stars that are brighter than Sirius. There'd be so many stars in the sky, you'd have a hard time seeing anything beyond the globular cluster itself. There'd be light pollution from the sky itself. <clears throat> Macy 13 is easy to see in binoculars. Uh, any telescope will show uh, several of its stars. The bigger the scope, the more stars you will see. And Macy 13 as a characteristic is that it has streams of stars that tend to bend to the rightward direction. This is less obvious in the picture here, but it's quite uh, evident uh, to the eye. It also has an unusual feature called the propeller. If you look at the picture here, you'll see there's a three armed feature here, dark feature that I was able to see here in the 10 inch telescope also. So globular clusters have little quirks like that. They're all different. But Messier 13 is one of the most beautiful. Um, I want to show you all uh, briefly another uh, one last object is Messier 51. This one is a galaxy and known as the whirlpool uh, for obvious reasons. So here's a, a very nice uh, picture taken by an amateur. And uh, this one is a spring object. And it's 27 million light years away. And as galaxies go, this is not too far. This is not quite our neighborhood, but it's a, a relatively nearby galaxy. Uh, this is a galaxy that was first recognized at what was called then a spiral nebula. And obviously it has a spiral pattern to it. And this is a drawing made by Lord Ross with a 72 inch telescope who discovered this spiral pattern in 1850. And uh, it was thought at the time that this was uh, uh, an example of a star being born that the gas was spiraling inward to form a star at the center. And it's not until the 1920s when Hubble realized how far away these spiral nebula were uh, and that they actually were uh, galaxies just like our Milky Way that uh, this notion was dispelled. So, um, so what we have here are actually two galaxies. And uh, you can see that the, the main one is somewhat distorted, is elongated along this axis here. And there are a bunch of streams of uh, light here uh, that look somewhat peculiar. And that's because the two galaxies are undergoing a collision. And uh, so the, uh, uh, the mutual gravity are stretching the uh, orbits of the stars into the patterns that we see. So I would like to show you a uh, video of a simulation, a computer calculation of colliding galaxies. It's not this an example of M51, but I think it is uh, uh, illuminating as to this phenomenon. So uh, on computers, we can uh, create spinning galaxies with uh, a number of uh, masses, stars basically, and uh, we can throw them at each other and track the position of each of these star objects in the computer and, uh, and follow and see what happens while the galaxies are in collision. And the video here stops regularly to show a comparison with actual objects that we see in the sky. And you can see the two centers approach and they sped up as they did so. <clears throat> and there's a splash of stars here. So a collision like that always results in the merging of the two galaxies, which takes typically about a billion years. So they will go through each other a couple, two or three times. And the distance between the stars and the galaxy is so large compared to their size that there's never a collision between stars, despite what it looks like in the simulation like this. So the, the stars from the different galaxies literally interpenetrate, interpenetrate each other and go through. And so the streams that we see uh, and the dance of the stars here is all caused by the gravity of, uh, of the stars between each other, between the two galaxies. So many of these are truly spectacular objects. And MF51 is a manifestation of that, or an example of that. OK, so. Uh, Looking deep into the universe is like whoops. a trip down memory whoops, lane. Whoops, whoops, whoops. The farther from Earth we look, the farther back in time we see. Starlight from the remote past is just arriving at Earth now. 
Thank you. Okay, so we're back. Can you see the slide now? Yes. Okay, good. So here's a picture with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, M51 in all its glory, you can see here in red the numerous objects, the few nebula like Messier 8 that we saw. You can see clusters of stars strewn along the uh, spiral arms of the galaxy. Incredibly detailed and complex dark cloud. These are clouds of dust along the spiral arms as well as in front of the companion galaxy here. So, uh, the uh, two galaxies, the companion is visible in a small telescope. It has a strong, the galaxy has a strong spiral structure that can be seen in a 10 inch scope. And here's what I saw in an 18 inch telescope. And so by then the, the spiral lines really stand out and you can see a fair amount of detail in them, including you know, their, uh, the fact that they're not perfect spirals, that parts of them are brighter than others. And you can see little blotches that are, are actually stellar clusters in the other galaxy. So uh, we're almost running out of time, so I apologize for that. So I want to say just a few words about how to observe the Macy objects. As you can see, they can, uh, the catalog contains 110 objects. Many of them are truly fascinating and uh, also beautiful. And uh, after you, uh, you learn your way around the solar system, you know, the Macy objects are sort of the next step, the next most interesting thing to look at. Uh, because they're reasonably bright, they're fairly easy to, to find, and uh, they're uh, very interesting to look at and show well in most uh, instruments. Actually, several of them are visible to the naked eye. Uh, some are easy, uh, some are object cr clusters like Macy 6, 7, Macy 8, I mentioned earlier, and so forth. Uh, some are harder to see. You barely see a little patch of light if you know exactly, excuse me, where to look. And some are very hard, like Macy 33, excuse me, is a galaxy uh, that is a very good test of the darkness of your, of your sky. If you can see M33 with the naked eye, you know you have a beautifully dark sky. More than half of the Macy objects are visible in uh, regular binoculars like 10 by 50. Uh, so however, to uh, observe uh, the sky with binoculars, you'll need to mount them on a tripod uh, for stability. And also for this, you'll need an L, so what's called an L bracket to mount them on the tripod. Uh, you can also use uh, the image stabilized binoculars that will compensate for the jitter of your hands. Uh, and but those are much more expensive, uh, but they work very well. Uh, large astronomy binoculars are a lot more fun to use. Uh, here's an example. So here's a pair of normal binoculars, seven by 50 with a strap. Here's uh, bigger ones for astronomy, 16 by 70. These are big enough that you absolutely need a tripod. And it doesn't come with a strap because uh, it, it doesn't make sense to hold them around your neck. Uh, all Macy objects become much more interesting in a telescope of about four inches in diameter, such as the, uh, the telescope at the White Rock Library that you can borrow. Uh, you can't do this now because of COVID, but uh, otherwise you can borrow a telescope for a week at a time. And here's a picture of that uh, instrument. And it has a little dot finder that points, uh, that projects a little a red dot in the sky to where the telescope is pointing to help you find what you're looking for. To uh, find the objects, there's the old school method, which uh, uses star charts and star hopping. So you could start from stars that you see in the sky with your naked eye, and you go from there using your chart uh, towards the object you're interested in with your telescope. The high-tech way is to use a computerized telescope like the one shown here, the orange and black uh, telescope here. Uh, basically here, once the telescope is calibrated, you punch the number of uh, the uh, Macy object you want to look at and it will automatically point at it, just like if you were at a professional observatory. Um, to enjoy the experience, I recommend uh, you know, doing a bit of uh, reading on the object so you know what you're looking at. Uh, because uh, some of them are spectacular, but some are not. Uh, so if you know what they really represent, uh, what they are physically, uh, it becomes far more interesting. Also take your time and learn to see. Uh, looking at faint objects in telescope is not like looking at uh, objects in daytime uh, with a naked eye. It's a different uh, visual experience and uh, you can learn to see more. Um, and uh, because we're pressed with time, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, if you see all the Macy objects, 
uh, you can get a certificate from the Astronomical League. You can go on their website, find out how to do that. And there are many, many more objects. There are other lists of objects, but uh, to observe like the Caldwell 100 and the Herschel 400, but really the sky is the limit. Uh, you can, there are many, many objects uh, uh, to be seen out there beyond the Macy objects. So thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I gave you uh, some motivation to go out there and uh, explore the Macy catalog. Thank you very much. Thank you, Didier. Um, that was a very interesting talk. Um, and uh, Stephen Becker com compliments you. He says, fantastic talk, Didier. Didier, okay. um, I only see one question at the moment, and that refers to um, Messier number eight. Um, okay. Chick Keller is asking, um, how come that O5 star isn't much brighter than other nearby stars in that nebula? Uh, so maybe you can show that picture again. Yes, let's eight. see. Let me, uh, I think it's here. And I have to go to share. We'll pick this. How's that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the fact is that the other stars in the cluster here uh, that are not that much dimmer are, also, are mostly B stars. So in other words, these are also massive stars, uh, most of them. Uh, there are many other stars that are like in the, the globules, for example, stars are being born right now. Uh, but we can't see them in optical light because the dust obscure what's going on inside. We can see with infrared telescopes, we can see here stars being born and these little objects that will one day become very bright objects. So, uh, and uh, the, uh, the other star here that powers the, here we go, this star here that powers the, or that illuminates the hourglass nebula is, I think is an 07 star. So, uh, but there's a lot of obscuration. And uh, so that why it appears much fainter, even if it's also a massive luminous star, not quite as much as, as this one. But um, so uh, there's a lot of obs obscuration going on here too. So um, it all makes sense. It really does, but you have to dig into the details uh, and uh, the observations and properties of each of these stars and how much you're obscured by dust to, uh, to put the picture together. Yeah, it really is kind of subtle. Um, I, I, I seem to see little diffraction spikes on that one star and, and, and not on some of the others, you know, so that indicates that it is somewhat brighter, but, but, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not glaringly obvious that it's, that True. it's well, really a lot brighter, but. And, and there's an also uh, another aspect of this is uh, what, which I've uh, realized by looking, uh, re preparing this talk is that um, if you look at uh, images by amateurs like this, the one that I showed uh, the, uh, the nebula is um, the brightness of the stars uh, is, uh, because they do so much image processing to enhance the uh, visually appealing parts of the nebula and so forth. The relative brightness of stars depends on their color and how the processing was done. So if you just look at this one picture, you could be misled uh, because of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I have um, a number of comments on, on how, um, how good the presentation was. A fantastic talk, Didier. Thank you. Great talk. Love the presentation, especially the historical perspective from Gerald and so. Um, so yes, uh, the, that's all the questions that have come in. Um, thank you once again, DDA, for sharing um, this, uh, this talk with us um, tonight. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in, and good night. Thank you. Good night.